All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome Catherine Matthijs, who is also in San Diego. How are you doing, Catherine? I'm doing well, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, and Catherine is the founder and CEO of Civility Partners, an HR consulting a uh, company focused especially on helping organizations create positive and respectful workplace cultures. And that's what we want to talk about today is how do you create a positive and respectful workplace culture? And what are the responsibility, what are the shared responsibilities as well as individual responsibilities of both employers and employees in order to achieve this? So Catherine, maybe to start off, I mean, Number one, how do you how do you recognize what kind of culture you have today before you think about like changing? How do you actually uh, gauge the type of culture you have? Yeah, well, there's two ways. One is if managers and supervisors and leaders are really observing things and, and keeping their ears to the ground, they'll notice things like people don't. Uh, necessarily share ideas freely, or you'll notice that a manager can get defensive and and often says, oh, we've already tried that, it doesn't work. So there's a, a, a skill that all anybody who's leading anybody in an organization uh, needs to have, which is, you know, again, just being super aware of interactions and communication and things they observe. A more formal way, of course, is to do a climate assessment. So when we work with organizations, that's where we start. And uh, we measure things like employee engagement, job satisfaction, relationships with leaders, um, communication processes, um, you know, are those effective and efficient? So that that's a more formal way. And then you really have a benchmark to say here, you know, 80% of people think X, and we need to make a change there. And then, you know, what can we do to, to make that change? And obviously, that's uh, that's complicated a little more now by the fact that you may have a remote workforce, you may have a hybrid workforce, maybe a globally dispersed workforce. Um, so then, the the onus on on the management to actually figure out, as you say, go and observe. I mean, you have to put some real work into it because it's not like wandering around the office if you have a, a, a dispersed and have virtual or hybrid organization. Yeah, yeah, and I want to add to that. So, so, so many organizations do not give managers and supervisors resources to be able to do that. You know, it's like everybody's doing the harassment prevention training, which is real far down the, the line of behavior. But imagine mm -hmm. what it what it would be like if managers and supervisors learned how to listen for microaggressions or gossip or sarcasm that push the line and then uh, learned how to coach that type of behavior. And that is something we see in all of our clients, that, that the managers don't have those skills, nor have they been asked to engage in those skills. So um, that's a, a, I say easy, but kind of an easy, low-hanging fruit way to start working on your culture is really giving managers and supervisors these tools to manage the people part of their job. So then, I mean, when you work with them, um, with with managers and that, and you provide them with the tools, how do you how do you create the balance? Because sometimes when you say to people, "Oh, you know, look out for this or look out for that," you'll get the you'll get people who kind of go a little bit too far, become zealots, and are sort of imagining things. Every how do you create that balance? Because I feel like we live in a world today where where balance and nuance has been lost in a a lot of ways and yeah. and i think that it's very easy to go one way or the other or to you know overreact or be too dramatic how do you help that piece i'm really fascinated about that actually yeah you know what in our training that we're, where we're doing that um we aren't necessarily training the managers and supervisors to be on the lookout for ne negative behavior mm -hmm. all the time and then go around you know don't do that what we're training them to do is to co-create and collaborate with their team to develop a culture inside their team that everyone's had a hand in creating. And then therefore there's buy-in and then the employees start to feel comfortable to call each other out so that um, you want to develop a, a team culture where vulnerability is okay. And there, therefore, you know, someone could say, hey, you know, yesterday you made this comment in a meeting or you said something in an email and I just want to talk to you about it because it, it, you know, 
kind of hurt or it looks like a microaggression or it could have hurt somebody else. So that's the real key is to give everyone the tools to um, address these things. And then managers and supervisors get that special skill of coaching. You know, how do you coach someone who sort of always engages in gossip or um, incivility of some sort? Mm -hmm. And and then on the on the flip side, on the employee side themselves, um, I mean, I often see that you you know some people feel like it's responsibility of the organization to, to do everything, and I just sit back and I wait for them to take care of things. But there's an accountability and a personal responsibility as well. If, as you just outlined there that if you're going to create this this culture, then everybody has to participate. Yeah, you know, I see that a lot in trainings too. And, and I often give a speech similar to what you just said, where I tell everyone, look, I know it's easy to kind of say, well, thanks for the training, but I'm not implementing any of this stuff until leadership does X, Y, or Z. Um, and that's wrong. You know, every single person in the organization participates in culture uh, and everyone has the responsibility to influence the culture. And so I do definitely have those conversations with our, our training attendees when doing that training. Um, it's a little bit kind of chicken egg, though, because if the organization is sending messages that it's unsafe to speak up, of course, people aren't going to. So there's got to be this real um, agreement or, you know, that the the leaders are willing to say, we want you to speak up for each other. We want you to speak up for yourself. Um, you know, we don't punish people if that happens. And then the other thing is, for example, I often go into companies where, let's say, the, an executive VP is engaging in real toxic, bullying types of behavior. And because that person is a high performer, it's been allowed. Their behavior is excused. And that's also the wrong way to go about this, right? You can't tell employees, we want to have a positive culture. We want you to participate in that positive culture. But never mind the EVP, he or she is the exception. So the organization has to be willing to address poor behavior. Yeah. And I guess and the other part, too, is sometimes when you hear like, yeah, we want to create a, you know, a positive and uh, culture and all of that. It doesn't mean like a, a rah-rah where everybody's just happy right. all the time. It right. also means a, a place, as you as you outlined, where it's where you can have disagreements, you can have forthright discussions, you can raise issues and all of that. So it's not you're just trying to create like you're putting in foosball tables and massage right. chairs and everybody's smiling all the time. Right. That's, I would say that we're, this is not, you know, a world of rainbows and unicorns. You're going to mm -hmm. disagree. We're all going to misstep. People are going to have conflict. But if you can, how your culture is going to dictate how people to respond to those things. And so um, that's the goal is and culture, you know, exists in all of the little nuanced interactions that we have. So an organization might have the core value of respect or inclusivity or customer service. But if an employee in a team is experiencing something very different than that. That's the culture for that employee. So culture really exists in the nuanced little day-to-day -day interactions that happen all the time. Uh, and that's where organizations are missing. They're not focused on, on those little nuanced conversations and they should be. Yeah. And then I guess that's a, that's, that's obviously where people like yourself come in because I don't think, uh, I mean, Everybody perceives themselves as being busier than they've ever been in their lives right before. Personally, I, I don't agree with that. I think they're more distracted than they've ever been. I think yeah. there's a big difference between the two. So being able to actually focus on nuance, I mean, that that definitely takes a skill and it takes a commitment. And, and you, you have to really want to do that in order because, I mean, you could easily just gloss past it, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, but that's, you know, the organization needs to start saying this is our culture and it, it's a culture of awareness and we're going to give you the resources to do that. Uh, certainly it can be exhausting to focus on nuances and take that extra couple seconds to make sure your email isn't, you know, saying something inappropriate or what have you. But that's the key to to life. It's the key to making sure people feel good at work. Yeah. And what it's interesting about what you just said there is it does require people to be a little bit more deliberate, a little bit more aware. And as you said, it's like instead of firing off the email is actually reading it again and then trying to look at it maybe through the eyes of the receiver or whatever. That that takes a, a commitment. Right. And it yeah. takes a little bit of slowing down. And I think that's that's the challenge for people is to actually 
stop and say, yeah, you know something? I do have another minute to review this email. I'm not like, I'm not so critical. My life is so critical that minute is, if I if sacrifice this minute, it's going to make that big a difference, but it could make a huge difference to um, the relationship with whoever's on the receiving end. And you know what? That's what I tell my coaching clients. So I coach those EVPs that I <laughs> just described <laughs> who are engaging in poor behavior. And uh, often they are very high performers. And so we do end up having conversations around this idea that, look, um, it might be faster for you in the moment to chew them out and tell them they need to fix it. Uh, but in the end, it actually wastes time because they're going to go back to their desk. They're not going to be doing their work. They're going to be distracted. They're afraid of you. They're going to ask less questions because they're afraid of you. Um, so it actually takes less time if you were to take a step back in those moments and teach them something versus just freaking out on them. Uh, and you know, also for organizations themselves, everyone's going to kill me for saying this, but you have to look at how focused are you on performance. And if performance trumps behavior, then that's the kind of organization that's toxic. So uh, just to give an example of that, we used to have a client who um, managers, well, everybody in the organization, the, the CEO was wanting everyone to be, you know, like 95% billable. And I just kept telling him, you got to give managers a little bit less. They could be 90% billable or 85 because how are, when are they managing if they're 95% mm -hmm. billable, just like their employees? And of course, he didn't like that idea. One of the reasons were we parted ways. But, um, you know, it's, what message are you sending if people can't actually manage? All you're doing is burning them out because they're working, you know, 12, 15 hour days all day, every day. Um, and is that really useful? Is that helpful to your bottom line? So those are the kinds of things right. to be thinking about. And then just and, and then said from an from a, an employee point of view, sometimes I feel today is that you know people are so used to um, throwing their two cents in on everything, right? And mm -hmm. you know having strong opinions and are and being on social media and all of this kind of stuff that it's. I guess it's hard then when you come into a company in order like what what is what is good interaction what is good feedback what is just like you know noise I mean those kind of things I think I feel that that's much more of a challenge than it's ever been because I mean you know my generation when I grew up like pre-internet and all of that you know there were only so many things you could do now you've now you're yeah. just used to being like oh I'm going to comment oh I'm going to say I'm going to put my two cents in on this like and I find that 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 part is the part that's kind of hard to reconcile yeah, I agree. Uh, I think it, you know, it goes back to those nuanced interactions and the managers and supervisors co-creating uh, the team environment so that the team can decide or the manager could say, you know, sometimes I, I can't take all of your two cents I, or I can take your two cents, but ultimately I have to make the decision and don't be mad at me. You know, I've got to do it. That's my role. Um, versus if the manager and the team does want to have a more um, everybody has input and feedback kind of a culture, but, but all of that goes back to those conversations that managers and supervisors need to be having. And that, that's another thing I, I don't see. We're focused again on that, you know, the anti-harassment, don't do this. Our corporate mm -hmm. policies are about all the things you're not supposed to do. Why are organizations not focused on the proactive building of a positive workplace culture through those nuanced interactions so that if managers and supervisors are talking to their teams every single day about the team environment, you know, what's the word of the day? Let's talk about it. Or let's pick a core value and talk about how we're living it or not living it. Or let's acknowledge someone for this. Or how do you guys want this to unfold? You know, th those regular, ongoing, proactive conversations about building the culture, that, that's the answer. And managers and supervisors just aren't doing that. And I think also just being being creative. I had an example recently of um, the, there's uh, some people I know in their company. They were closing down an office because the people had gone, you know, remote, uh, virtual during the during COVID, and they also decided they wanted to continue on on that on that process. Mm -hmm. And some of the some of the people they needed new equipment, right? But the company didn't have the money for new equipment, right? But then came up with this very creative solution where they said, "We're closing down the office. If you if you guys you go." You go sell all the equipment in the office and then you can buy new equipment for yourselves with the money generated and kind of um, empowering the people and handing it over to them and saying, you know, instead of just saying, no, I'm sorry, we can't afford that. We're saying, well, here's a way you could. It's up to you guys. Go do it. 
And they I do. like that. Yeah, that's a great example. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so there are, uh, to your point, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of creative ways you can get to kind of engage people because sometimes people think, oh, well, I can't do all of this stuff because I don't have the time or the money, but it's not about time or money, isn't it? It's about being creative and about making the time. Absolutely. I mean, you could spend staff meetings. Um, you know, I, I often joke, you know, pick a, pick a core value and then just have some conversation about it. Hey team, the core value for today is X. What are the ways that we are living this as a team and what are the ways that we aren't? Um, there's tons of little self-assessments out there about communication style or personality style, all sorts of free things. Hey, team, let's all take this assessment and then we'll have a conversation about it. Um, just, to, you know, that's a way to really remind everyone that we all think mm -hmm. and communicate differently. Um, you know, we, you could get butcher paper from Ikea for $4 and tape it to a wall. And, you know, I could have it behind me and write in things that um, everybody appreciates in each other or sending out a thank you card. I mean, yeah, there's, it's not about time or money. And that's, that's the beauty in those little nuanced interactions. I'm not talking about big, mm -hmm. you know, some organizations need big cultural overhauls, which is what, what we do. But um, those managers and supervisors who just want to be proactive, that it does not require time and money. And I would argue it also does not require permission from um, the powers that be in your organization to just be focused on building an environment where people feel comfortable. And that's really what it is. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, one of the things I, I took over a company some years back um, and when I came in as CEO, one of the first things I did with the executive team is we just had a, a half day where we did and it wasn't um, Myers-Briggs. It was something it was something a little more complicated, but we did all these and we had somebody to facilitate and we all did our own like personality, all that kind of things. And it was a really interesting discussion then because then it gave people insights into, OK, I get it. I need to approach this person in this way. This this person over here, a completely different way. But it, it, it and and it's kind of bonded because people were kind of saying, "Well, I'm at this and I'm at that," you know, kind yeah. of, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah, I agree. And and then you have the ability to kind of joke about it later. For yeah. example, uh, we do DISC here. One of our trainers mm -hmm. is certified, and that's a service we offer our clients. So we we've done it internally a few times along the way. And um, I'm a high. I, which means I'm very people oriented, but I'm also a high D, which means I'm very decision oriented. Just tell me what I need and let's move on. So sort of fast paced um, versus the trainer who's just certified. She's just all I, all influence. She doesn't read the details. And so, um, for example, I sent an email recently with some changes to things to my whole team. And at the top, I'm like, Tony, the um, bolded stuff is for you because I know you're just going to skim it. So I, <laughs> I bolded certain things because um, I knew that's all she was going to read versus others who would read more. And, you know, then we can kind of joke about it or, or, you know, or sometimes I'll call her and start right into business. And I'm like, oh, wait, sorry, my D got the best of me. How are you? What's going on? Because I know that's what she needs. And yeah, so doing those types of things can just be a great way to pull, you know, step back. And, oh, I got to communicate with you in a way that works for you. Yeah, and I think it. I think it breaks down a lot of barriers, and it makes people feel like they're 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 seen, and I think which is obviously right. important. And one last thing I wanted to uh, ask you about. I think here's a mistake a lot of organizations make, right? And that is in their approach to looking at skill sets of employees, because we tend to focus on. We go, okay, um, you know, Catherine is good at you know A and B, but she's not very good at D, E, and F, and we're going to focus on that, and we're going to make her good at and all of that instead of going why don't we figure out how to let her do more of A and B? Because that's what she's good at. That's what she's passionate about. That's what she wants to. And I think if more organizations did that, we that in and of itself would, would make a big impact. A hundred percent. And not to toot my own horn, I by no means am perfect. I feel that I do that pretty well as the leader of my little team. Mm -hmm. um, I do often wonder how that would translate if we were all a department working in a, a bigger organization, because um, we're small, we have the ability to, mm -hmm. you know, move like a school of fish. Um, but I feel like our, my team is really good at like, here, you should do that thing, because that's your strength. And just really recognizing what each other's strengths are. And, and partly that's because we talk about it a lot. Uh, we do something called a monthly impact meeting where 
Uh, we talk about impacts we've either had on clients where they've given us some great feedback or impacts that we've had on each other. Um, you know, to say thank you, this was really impactful for me that you did this. Um, so we, our projects, we kind of pass through different hands depending on, okay, you're the, you know, really strong mm -hmm. at this. So you do that part and then you're going to pass it to this person. Uh, so yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you and have found that to be super useful in my own little team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, and it and it can be it, it it is implementable at any size of organization if you put your mind to it. And at the end of the day, people are a lot happier doing things that they're good at and they're and they enjoy doing than they are at things that they're never going to be good at and they hate right. doing. <laughs> right, right. And part of that's me. I'm like, I hate organizing things and tracking things. I have a team member who loves to do that. So yeah. by all means, have at it. <laughs> yeah, I know we have we have somebody who's because uh, we have an automation engine in our uh, a workflow automation engine in our CRM, and we have one person who is just an absolute we, who will just build these things and go down into the and did mind boggling detail where you you know for the rest of us it would just be like oh this is horrendous, but she absolutely loves it and she's phenomenal at it. And yeah, you, and so then, it's, and then it's she's great. not burnt out because she's doing something yeah. she loves. You'd be burnt out if you were trying to do that. So oh, yeah. Yeah, every, everybody yeah. wins. If people are doing the things they're good at, they're not going to burn out the way that they might otherwise. Exactly. Well, listen, Catherine, this has been fantastic. All of Catherine's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your company. Yep. So Civility Partners uh, focuses on turning around toxic work environments. We do a whole lot of training. We do uh, coaching for leaders who are engaging in toxic behavior. And we do workforce surveys and culture overhaul. I uh, also have a ton of courses on LinkedIn Learning if you uh, subscribe to LinkedIn Premium. So uh, I'm at civilitypartners.com. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm all over the place. Always happy to <laughs> talk shop with anybody who wants to who wants to engage <laughs> all right well listen thanks again Catherine thank you for watching and listening and I'll see you all again soon thank you thank you